Welcome back, everyone. There is still a lot to talk about, and there will also be some opportunities for talking. Uh, but Rene has to take a break, so for that reason, we are a little bit pressed to get started. Uh, because otherwise, he will miss his plane, and sometimes rules and regulations, you shouldn't be too playful with them, at least not when it's about planes. Uh, so uh, many, many of you have probably talked to him already. He has a background in psychology with a focus on psychology of personality. So what are the differential factors that you might, so to say, find in personalities? The habilitation thesis is called Playfulness in Adults, Its Definition, Structure and Measurements. Uh, currently he's a professor at the University of Halle. And one of the things that we are really looking at there, I think is probably the only place in the world is to see, well, can you get any kind of handle on or measure of what a trait like playfulness might be about in adults? Yeah. So, take us away from me. Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks, Andreas, and everyone from the team. It really has been a treat uh, for me to come here, and um, it was really a great time, and i um, happy to talk about the research that we did over the past years, as you mentioned. I'm sorry, I cannot join much of the discussion afterwards because my plan that was initially booked has been cancelled, so I have to take an earlier one and have to rush off after my talk. But um, all questions can be directed to Kai, who is a member of my lab in Halle, and most of you will have seen him yesterday when he presented his poster on creativity and playfulness. So. Um, yeah, I was, uh, had to smile when Richard told us about uh, uh, Zurich because I worked in Zurich for quite a long time and order and everything is very important there. And <clears throat> of course I try to bring some order to play, playfulness and so on. And I will introduce you to our suggestion of how to order this. Uh, first of all, uh, practically all of the research that we do is on playfulness and not so much on play. So play, of course, the actual behavior that can be observed directly, so in animals and also in children and of course in adults and so on. And we we'll know about all these things so that play serves important functions, so in terms of preparation for survival in animals and as a way to assess developmental stages and so on and, and there are certain expressions like the play phase in chimpanzees for example and then they signal yeah everything that happens now is in a playful way and don't take it too seriously and um, Gordon Burkhardt whom you see here and others have spent a great deal of work on uncovering the important aspects there but what we do is try to get a handle on what playfulness as a personality trait could be and how its structure could look like. So first of all, coming from a psychology background, I probably should start with some definitions of what we understand as a personality trait. So traits are dimensions of individual differences in tendencies to show consistent patterns of thoughts, feelings and actions. And the idea is that they are relatively stable across time and situations. So I would argue that playfulness as a personality trait is something that is relatively stable across time and situations, but the way you express it will be different across time and situation. It's uh, very similar to if you think of like extroversion, for example, even the most extroverted person in this room knows now it's my time and I talk and you have to be quiet and listen and at least pretend to be interested but this doesn't mean that you have extroverted thoughts and that you know that you would do it differently and better and would be more energetic and would have the better jokes or jokes at all or whatever and so uh, and the same is true for playfulness so even the highly playful individual so high expressions in this trait, knows, okay, at this point in time, it's better to play in my head, for example, and just think about things. This is perhaps a bit different to what uh, you explained uh, to us in the morning, that I think you 
mentioned that play is always the interaction with others and that it cannot be done in the mind or, or something along this way. I hope I quote you somewhat correctly. I would say that you also can be playful in your mind. And that actually lots of the things that we do as adults and that could count as expressions of playfulness are actually in our mind. I mean, we have things like coming up with the word play, playing things through in your mind if you have to solve a different puzzle or question or whatever. And this is what happens in your mind. So it's not always observable directly, but um, still we can have some ideas on the structure and perhaps also measure some consequences. Of course, we are not the first ones to think about these things. We have already heard about Schiller's idea and why this should be important. And uh, then you have all, I have lots of big names there, like uh, Freud, of course, who had also some ideas. Not the most playful ideas, I would say. So play is just sublimination of your sex drive. So all types of dancing, for example, would be just a sublimination of what you really wanted to do with this person and so on. And, uh, <laughs> and you see there are lots of different approaches and ideas. Recently something very interesting has been presented. Peterson and Seligman out of the field of positive psychology would argue that playfulness could be even a strength of character, a morally positively valued trait not sure whether this is true in all cases and I think in some of the discussions we also had some ideas on potentially negative effects of play and playfulness but as an idea I think that's quite interesting so is there a moral or virtuous component to play and playfulness as well and um, in a more structured way I think many of you will be familiar with this with Nina, Nina Liebermann's great work on playfulness, its relationship to imagination and creativity, published in 1977. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, I would strongly encourage you to have a look at it. It's a great work. Uh, she was in educational psychology, and what she did was she just went into kindergartens and schools, observed the children, and then, as we do now, tried to find an order or a structure of what play could be in <coughs> the children. And she suggested that playfulness is composed of sense of humor, spontaneity, and manifest joy. And these are then broken down into several other categories. While this is a very stimulating idea, and I think in a very interesting approach of gathering data, I also think that there are problems. So for example, I think you can be humorous without being playful. And if you now say, yeah, sense of humor is an inherent part of playfulness, then this would also mean that all expressions of humor must be playful in a bit. This part is also problematic because Lieberman would also argue yeah, that this is at least trait-like, but this is an effective component. And while I would also say that most of play is potentially associated with the elicitation of positive emotions, joy, happiness, uh, or content, um, and, uh, and interest, for example. I'm not sure whether manifest joy in the sense of laughter, pleasure, or preference must always be part of this playful experience. <clears throat> but I think it's a very important uh, idea on how to structure playfulness, and I will come to, back to some of the issues here. So, one of the questions we spend a lot of time thinking about is what is playfulness? And uh, one of the answers is it depends totally on the perspective. Here you see an overview on some suggestions. So Lynn Barnett would say, yeah, it's just a combination of gregariousness, uninhibitedness, comedic uh, ideas, and um, you being dynamic. Bishop and Chase say, yeah, it's just the combination of exploration, joy, liberty, spontaneity, and so on, and the list goes on and on, up to uh, an idea developed in Taiwan, for example. You and colleagues suggested it's a combination of pleasantry, initiative, and concentrating, and creativity, so there might be also some cultural impact here that is relevant. 
Um, and you see that there are some similarities and that there is some overlap, but that there are also differences in there. And part of our problem is when we started to uh, work on playfulness, we thought, yeah, we just look what is in the literature and then develop measures for this. But the field is so homogeneous, uh, I'm sorry, heterogeneous, <laughs> uh, that it was really difficult to find the common ground here. And uh, then looking further, uh, I think still at the moment the most frequently used definition, at least from my perception in psychology, has been proposed by uh, Lynn Barnett in 2007, and she suggests that playfulness is the predisposition, so this would be the indication that it is also trait-like, to frame or reframe a situation in such a way as to provide oneself and possibly others with amusement, humor, and or entertainment. And you see here a very strong focus on entertainment, joy, fun, and so on. And one of the starting points for what we then later did was the question of whether something is missing here. So does playfulness always have to be tied to fun, amusement, joy, entertainment, and so on, or whether there is something else in there. And I think many of the presentations on playful learning, for example, also give an indication, well, there must be an, uh, also other components involved here, so something going in the direction of curiosity or an intrinsic motivation or something in this direction. So uh, when we look at how adults play, these are just a few random examples. You see that uh, this differs strongly uh, in its expressions. So there's something you do together. People from Munich and Nuremberg will tell you what they are doing here. So it's finger hacking. <laughs> it's unclear why they are doing it, but they can tell you. It's happened. Yeah, um, so then you have here a student who has to prove uh, a certain formula here, and, and he or she said, I don't know how to prove this, so please enjoy this dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> so then you have office, office jokes like in the printing room, so you have the advice, please do not print large jobs. And the clever guy comes and prints a large Steve Jobs. And then, of course, if you are Salvador Dali and you're looking for a pet, you go for the anteater. And I would also say that this is an expression of his playfulness. So if we think about what could be motivating these things, uh, then we can say, OK, this is directed at fun and entertainment and so on. But I think there are also other things in there. And one of the first things uh, we did is something that we do in psychology, at least from my perspective, much too rarely, uh, just ask people. So I uh, designed a study where people were asked to list uses of playfulness in their every, everyday life in five areas. Uh, in, during their leisure time, at work, when being with work colleagues, when with friends and partner, their romantic partner. And the idea was, well, if Lieberman and others are right, then all of the things that are listed here will dwell around the idea of entertainment, fun, amusement, and so on. Uh, I had more than 300 adults that participated in this, not a student sample, as you can see here. Uh, there was a large variety I mentioned functions. People were able to list more or less at least one for each of these categories. Women were a bit more productive than men. But uh, the most important thing here is that I then grouped the uh, answers and ideas they had into broader categories, seven in total. And the first one is yeah, just humor and laughter, so I can use it to have fun, fool around, make others and myself laugh, and so on. And this is what had to be expected. Then there is the idea that playfulness contributes somehow to creativity, so to spend my time more in a more, more interesting way, to create new things, pursue your hobbies, and so on. And then there is an interesting thing, so it's something that contributes to your relationships. So to cultivate relationships, communicate with others, socialize, to show your affection, flirting, and so on, and so on, as a contributor to well-being, 
increase well-being, make me feel good, experience pleasure and so on, to coping with stressful situations. So use your playfulness to loosen up a difficult situation at work, for example, or when fighting with your partner. Kind of mastery orientation. People use their playfulness to motivate themselves or others, to get information, to be more active and so on, and also to unwind, relax, recharge, so coping uh, more in the, uh, uh, directed at yourself. So as you can see here, it was pretty clear that uh, uh, entertainment and fun are important uh, factors here. But if you look, look at something like mastery orientation or that it can contribute to relationships in specific ways, then you could say, well, perhaps there's really more to, the, to play and playfulness than just say, yeah, it's fun and entertainment and so on. So we then looked at existing measures. And then the trouble really started because uh, if you go through the articles that describe measures of adult playfulness, what you rare, very rarely will find is a theoretical framework, so an explanation on why it's these categories that uh, uh, constitute playfulness. Um, the psychometrics are often unclear, so all the things on reliability, for example, or the structure that is inherent in this is also often very problematic. In some cases, the type of information, uh, type of analysis is not even clear that has been used for the development. One problem of this field from my perspective is that many measures were one-hit wonders, so used in only one study, but never again, never really investigated. and. In one of the studies, we tried to collect as many measures as possible, and we wrote to an author, and he said, oh, thanks for reminding me, uh, this was sometime in the 70s, I don't think I have the items anymore, and uh, we'll write to a colleague who might have a hard copy, but uh, this never materialized. So, in some cases, that's really just for a single study, which also has validity issues, and of course, uh, many of the items, questions written for the assessment of playfulness have either a very narrow view, so uh, I can experience fun when playing, uh, but another problem is that uh, many of the item contents are really uh, difficult to relate to playfulness in its narrow sense. For example, you will I find items like, I'm an optimist, and they are used for assessing your playfulness. So there is a relation between optimism and playfulness, but they are not synonymous, so these are two different things. Same way for I'm cheerful or I laugh a lot. I have a good sense of humor, happy, and a very strange thing, empty versus full. We have to say whether you are rather empty or full. Just a hint, if you want to be playful in this questionnaire, you have to be full. <laughs> don't ask me why, I don't know, I'm not sure whether you offer uh, So there are severe problems in this, and as I mentioned earlier, so we thought, yeah, we want to have a model, and we want to, want to have a measure for playfulness, so we collected these instruments, we identified seven in total. Uh, these are a set together of 322 items that have been developed um, after cutting redundancies and overlaps and so on, we arrived at 160 different questions. By the way, about 20 to 25 percent, percent of these items were variations of I have a good sense of humor. So this is one of probably the most frequently used item for the subjective assessment of playfulness. Um, so we then collected all these uh, collected data with an adult uh, sample, again, not a student uh, sample, as you can see here. This is the mean age of the participants, somewhat balanced uh, for men and women, and then analyzed the data in a factor analytic approach. I will spare you the details. Uh, it's just a way of uncovering the structure that will, uh, is common in these items. The most important thing is this is what is here in this uh, final row. So these 160 items could be reduced to five global factors. 
And it's not a surprise to you that one is humorousness, so having a good sense of humor. Another one is cheerfulness, so being in a positive mood, being optimistic. Then, it's, then there is expressiveness, being lively, emotional, excitable, other directed, and intellectual. And um, yeah, we thought, uh, well, the items should reflect expert knowledge, because only experts should write uh, such items and develop questionnaires. But the problems are very evident, because um, if you ask whether you have a good sense of humor, then the items group together and you get a humorous factor. But I don't think that humor is uh, a part of playfulness. They are related, yes, but uh, they are still distinct. I will explain how in a minute. Uh, when doing this study, we also administered a measure for the big five personality traits and then found that this cheerfulness uninhibitedness factor is more or less a combination of extroversion and emotional stability. So this also doesn't assess playfulness, this assesses extroversion. And this one here, the expressiveness, assesses also extroversion. So the main takeaway point from this is that many of the existing measures are biased bias towards assessing extroversion, emotional stability, and humor. And most of the literature generated on playfulness, at least in this research field, is geared towards saying, oh, the extroverts are the playful ones, and the humorous ones are the playful ones, and the emotionally stable ones are the playful ones. So one of the questions we had is, well, is it really re reasonable to assess playfulness with such items? So I'm an optimist, I laugh a lot, have a good sense of humor, and so on. And just to give you an example, what problems could be. Uh, if you look at Lynn Barnett's great study from 2007, she did uh, focus groups with young adults, and they had to t the task to think about the most playful person they know, and then write down the characteristics of this of this person. And in an iterative process, this was then grouped and regrouped and then analyzed uh, in specific ways. And then she said, yeah, well, the structure of playfulness is gregarious, uninhibited, comedic, and dynamic. And these are the characteristics that are associated with these factors. So gregarious would be being cheerful, happy, friendly, outgoing, sociable, spontaneous, impulsive, and so on. This is active and energetic. Just go through this. This describes an extrovert. Active, dynamic, impulsive, sociable, outgoing. That's an extrovert. With this scale, you can uh, very well predict um, life satisfaction. Why? Being happy is a component of playfulness. You assess <coughs> playfulness with the item, I'm a happy person. You assess life satisfaction with, I'm satisfied with my life, and they correlate. So playfulness predicts life satisfaction, or does it? So the problem is, if you do it like this, you have, um, you, you mix the, um, uh, the, the predictor with the criteria. And the same goes for this. Why are the playful ones also the humorous ones? <coughs> This is the item that is used for the assessment. I'm a humorous person. This predicts then that you have a good sense of humor. You joke a lot. You are funny, you like to clown around, and so on. So that's, you're just measuring the same thing. And that's then the starting point uh, for our uh, work in this field. Uh, so we worked on a revised definition. First part is the same. So it's an individual difference variable allows you to frame or reframe everyday situations in a way such as they experience them as entertaining. So far, so good, so that's important. But also, intellectually stimulating and or personally interesting. The definition then goes on to say, yeah, those high in playfulness seek and establish situations in which they can interact playfully with others. They are capable of using their playfulness even under difficult situations to resolve tension. And it's also associated with a preference for complexity rather than simplicity, preference for and liking of unusual objects, 
activities, topics, or individuals. And you see this is an extension from the initial idea, playfulness is only there for fun, entertainment, and so on. And this is, um, goes along with um, a specific model where we identify four different facets that make up playfulness. So one is other directed playfulness, and uh, this is just liking to interact playfully with other people, so play with others. And the thing would be that they are good in these types of interactions. This is also most important for relationship satisfaction, for example, so a specific way of uh, engaging with your romantic partner. Then there's a lighthearted component. These are the ones that would say, I don't have to prepare my talk, I will just improvise and somehow it will work. And not sure what slide will be next, but sure I have seen it already somewhere and then can make something up <laughs> and so on. So they don't think too much about possible consequences because yeah, somehow it will work up and they don't like to plan ahead too much and just those spontaneous, carefree and so on. Intellectual uh, playfulness, so these are the ones that like um, complexity over simplicity, for example. They like playing with ideas, they like uh, solving problems, coming up with new solutions for existing problems and so on. And then there are the whimsical playful ones, and they are characterized by uh, going their own way. They are often recognized or regarded as extravagant, the preference for extraordinary things and people, unusual activities and so on. So, uh, earlier I mentioned, I think it's a problem to see sense of humor as a component of playfulness. Let's have a look at this component here, at whimsical playfulness. I think this is what drives the association between playfulness and humor. Because these ones here, the whimsical playful people, they should be able to observe things in their everyday life that others do not notice. So think of a random situation in public transport and you see something strange or potentially strange or mishap happens in a different person or your or mishap happens to yourself. And then the whimsical, playful people, they should start thinking. And from this observation, humor might occur. So they might be able to spot an incongruency and then use this for humor, for their own amusement or to amuse others. But they can also use it to do something unexpected or unusual or use it for their own whim or whatever. So uh, this could be one of the motors. And my argument would be it's better to measure these things because being humorous, being creative, being curious, and all the other things are, from my perspective, consequences of being playful. And you shouldn't measure the consequences, you should measure the core of what the concept is. Whether these four are exhaustive, or whether there are more, or whether a general factor of playfulness is enough, is up to discussion. But up to date, I think this is a quite good working model. And for the rest of my talk, I would like to show you some of the results that we have collected with, these, uh, with this model. Most of our research is done with a questionnaire for the assessment of these four facets. So it's a seven point answer format. You have to answer how you behave in general. So that's the marker of a trait measure. Uh, and items are like I do not live from day to day at all, I'd rather plan ahead long in advance. So it's a reverse coded item for the lighthearted facet. Do uh, I like to swim against the stream, that's the whimsical uh, playfulness one. If I want to develop a new idea further and think about it, I like to do this in a playful manner. Of course, it's the intellectual component. And uh, yeah, this here, for close friends with whom I can just fool around and be silly, would be the other directed component. So just a few examples so that you see how this is being measured. Of course, the questionnaire method has certain advantages. Usually it goes very quickly. It's just 28 items. It's five to 10 minutes, perhaps, in its assessment. But of course, uh, you could say, yeah, this is a subjective measure. 
and there could be some answer distortions in the way, in the sense that yeah, we all want to be playful, or nobody wants to be playful in Germany, or whatever. <laughs> so, <coughs> so we usually not only con collect the self-report, but also peer report. So we, uh, if you participate in one of our studies, you are, for example, this person here, and then you have the answer our question there. Yeah? And then we ask you to uh, give uh, another questionnaire to a person who knows you well, so like a good friend, your romantic partner, a family member, and this person has then to answer the same items, but in the he or she version, uh, yeah, depending on your gender. And then we compare these two and can see how good they converge and overlap. And, uh, but we also can see whether these ratings here alone predict certain outcomes for your life. And I will show you some of the findings here. So one of the things we are interested in is seeing whether self and peer ratings converge well or not. So this is just one example. So this is the overlap in the four facets in a sample of mixed um, acquaintances. So there are good friends in there, romantic partners. We didn't control for relationship status in there. And then these coefficients here are just the correlation coefficients between the two, and they are in about the range that you would find for any big five measure or things like extraversion or emotional stability and so on. So they are exactly what you expect. What we now do is we vary the level of acquaintanceship. So in the next step, we ask couples in romantic relationships. And the idea was, they should have more information about each other because they spend hopefully much time with each other. So uh, then, uh, as you can see, most of the coefficients go up, but intellectual playfulness goes a bit down. <laughs> I leave this up for you. <laughs> so this is the idea we potentially maximize information about the person. In the next step, we go the other way and reduce information and have zero acquaintance. So what we do is, for example, uh, <laughs> we have this design here. So we have a target a person and we collect what we call a thin slice of his or her behavior. In our case, we ask the participants to complete the questionnaires, but also to describe themselves in up to five sentences. We did not give any hint on that they should write about their playfulness or humor or whatever. It was totally up to you whether you write about your family, your work, education, hobbies, whatever. And then we uh, took uh, these descriptions that were written by the person, gave it to others that didn't know this person at all, and the person, these persons then had to complete the same measures as the person did for him or herself. And when you do this, you can see these are the aggregated scores across several judges. You can see that they are almost as good as in the other conditions in spotting the playfulness in the person based on the written texts. And this, I think, is important and is an important lesson because even if you try to hide your playfulness, it could enter the way you write. So if you write an application letter, there must be some ideas in there that help other people determine whether you are more or less playful person. And as said, the instruction was not to say anything about your playfulness at all. So this must be in other things. And what we then did was taking this another step further. There is the so-called linguistic word count program. And there you can search written texts for specific information. So per, for example, you can just look at the word count, how many words were there per sentence, uh, uh, do people talk about friends, so there's a group for words related to friends, to uh, any social processes, and so on. And then we correlate this with the self-ratings on playfulness and with the ratings by the, uh, the unacquainted um, 
uh, observers. And um, this is just a, a short ex extract from the full table, which is much, much longer. But I wanted to show you these findings here, marked in red. So people look, for example, for posit positive emotion expressions, for expressions for positive feelings in the text, and for less ex expressions indicating certainty. And these are the cues, some of the cues, that the people have used for identifying playfulness in the unacquainted person. So this supports the idea that this should be at the trade level, else it would be very difficult to find these uh, indicators in the language there. Yeah. Uh, just a few other findings. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the work of Gary Chick from Pennsylvania State University, who has developed the uh, signal theory of adult playfulness, and he argues that uh, playfulness uh, is a signal in sexual selection if you look for a long-term partner uh, because it should signal um, low aggressiveness to females and high vitality to the males. And he suggested that if we give uh, people a list of adjectives, then they should rank playfulness relatively high as a desired characteristic in their potential partners. And we tested this in a study in 2015, and you have here the expressions, so like kind of understanding is very important for everyone, uh, the intelligent sense of humor is important, and so on and so on. And somewhere in the middle uh, field, there is playful as an important characteristic. More important than the partner should be religious, have good heredity, should be a good housekeeper, and so on. The full picture is a bit more difficult because we can also control control for gender differences, and we can also and we also can also control for uh, inter-individual differences in playfulness. And if you look at the highly playful ones, then you can see that uh, for them having a playful partner is even more important. Another thing that we did recently is a study that looks somewhat like this. We are interested in testing the contribution of playfulness to relationship satisfaction. And we, what we do here is we collect ratings from the males. We only tested heterosexual couples in this study because we wanted to have clear assignments to one of the two groups. So we test playfulness in the males, we test playfulness in the females, in the self-reports, and both provide ratings on their uh, um, relationship satisfaction. And then we can see whether male playfulness is associated with his satisfaction, but also with her relationship satisfaction. And the other way around, of course, as well, whether her playfulness is associated with his, with his relationship satisfaction. And what we can also do is to look for uh, similarity in the partners. And there you can see that there seems to be some assortative mating for other directed playfulness. So they were quite similar in their other directed playfulness, but they, they differed strongly in the other facets here. Um, the, uh, the findings here uh, are so rich, I could talk 45 minutes or an hour about these things because we have many facets of relationship satisfaction, but I just want to highlight two things. Uh, there's one component of um, being satisfied with the fascination experienced in the relationship. And there you can see there is the relationship between, okay, the self ratings for him of his playfulness, this converges with his satisfaction. Same for her, it's even higher, 142 compared to 24. And you can also see the more playful she describes herself, uh, this contributes to his fascination with the relationship satisfaction. But not the other way around. His playfulness does not contribute to her fascination with the relationship. <laughs> then another facet that we... Could you just want to uh, uh, clarify what this fascination uh, Yeah. Oh, uh, what, what is fascination? So this is... Um, a uh, sense of awe, so to speak, with the partner, and is it like on the first day? Are you still fascinated with all the things that happen? Satisfaction with togetherness, so 
time spent together, joint activities, and so on. There you can see there is a strong effect for the self ratings for her, no relation for his self ratings, but in both cases, this contributes to the uh, satisfaction of the other party. Uh, one important outcome of this study is that it really depends on the facet that you look at. And not all facets of playfulness contribute positively to relationship satisfaction. Some are not uh, um, associated at all, but you can also say, think that those high in lighthearted playfulness can also cause tr troubles because they do not like to plan ahead and do things and are even less ordered and so on. Uh, we, in a further study, we took this one step further and also asked the males to uh, rate uh, her playfulness. So how playful does he think she is? And asked her to do the same for him. And then we can also relate this to the relationship satisfaction. Again, too complex, uh, uh, too many uh, findings here. But the uh, one thing that I want to highlight here, for example, is that uh, when she thinks he is playful, this corresponds with her relationship satisfaction in terms of satisfaction with the sexuality in the partnership, irrespective of his playfulness. So it's just what, she's, what she thinks. And there are many findings like this in there that really allow us to disentangle all of these different relations in there. Uh, I think in one of the other talks, uh, not today, but uh, yesterday or on uh, Monday, there was also mentioning of age differences. In short, this is, uh, is uh, cross-sectional, large data. Uh, by and large, there are no age associations here. There's somewhat less other directed playfulness with higher age. Could be that in younger age you're looking for the long-term relationships and uh, starting family is probably more important and then this could be more important, but th these effects are minor. The same is also found in, for, a diff for a different measure. This is just one single facet of playfulness. Again, a very large data set and you can see here also no gender differences across all of these data, and as you can see, it's more than 4,000 participants in here. And while these are no longitudinal data, I'm very confident that, by and large, age and gender do not play a major role here. Uh, we also did uh, some res research on um, physical activity and can show that uh, we can predict certain facets of uh, physical activity by playfulness. For example, the conduct of enjoyable activities, uh, physical self-efficacy, <laughs> but also just looking at the peer ratings, we can predict, I mean, you can say it's not such a large number, but at least 6.2% of the variance in the body mass index. And that's quite good, even if it's a relatively small number. Uh, we can also predict a relatively large number of the variance in the uh, health behaviors that the person does. So taking up sports, doing sports, and um, eating healthy, and so on. So uh, in short, playfulness seems to be associated with greater levels of uh, physical activity. In this study, we also had an experimental part in there. Uh, where our participants had to do a fine motor coordination test. Not sure whether you can see this here very well, but there are some sticks, small sticks in here. And on this plate, there are small holes drilled in. And your task is as fast as possible to, to put the sticks into the, the holes. And we asked our participants to do this in a standard uh, condition, but also under this condition here, so we bought uh, goggles that uh, simulate different uh, levels of vision impairment. And this is used in uh, driving, driver education. So if you're a drunk driver, you might have to drive with some of these goggles and then they can say, yeah, after drinking so and so many uh, beers, you have this and this impairment and then so on. 
And uh, we had uh, four of these goggles that simulate different levels of impairment. And what we can, and the task was to select one of these goggles and then do the task again. It is fine motor coordination task. And we can show that the more playful ones selected the more difficult condition and spent more time uh, experimenting with the goggles, for example. Um, this is very, very preliminary, but we also look at um, <clears throat> whether this has anything to do with certain uh, uh, activities uh, people pursue. So we tested, I think it was eight football teams, no pros, unfortunately, but uh, they were organized and to somewhat professional, um, but in a very minor league. And we were interested in seeing whether uh, Playfulness differs depending on the position you play. So the goalkeeper, defender, midfield, striker, and this is all football players. Uh, we heard a lot about Messi today, so he would be a midfield player. But as you can see here, so SMAP is global playfulness, total score. But as you can see here, comparatively larger scores in all of these facets are found for the strikers and the comparatively lowest scores for the defenders. And again, in this study, we are also asked for a peer rating by the coach of the players. And you see that the same findings are reflected here. They also think that the strikers are the most playful ones, and then that the defenders are uh, lowest in the playfulness. So it could be that there's a interaction here with playfulness. Um, this is very pre preliminary, small number, so we had only eight teams, I think, and very small number in each of these, these groups. Um, yeah, just to wrap up, um, here's an overview on other selected uh, findings, so we can also show that playfulness is associated with academic achievement in a written exam on psychological assessment, the students uh, score better than the non-playful students, for example. Um, we can also show things like this. Um, when we ask participants to rate their liking and disapproval of artwork like this, for example, so high information, low structure, high structure, low information, then we find that higher playfulness goes along with greater liking, lower disapproval of this, but no differences for this. And the same is found if you use this material. Would you like to work on this workplace? Would you disapprove to work on this workplace? Would you like to work here? Would you disapprove to work here? Playful ones like to work here, lower disapproval of working here, no difference at all for this here. Could point to a greater flexibility that uh, the playful ones have. Um, uh, a final thought is um, not a very religious person, and, uh, but uh, I st still think that this is a very, very interesting book. Uh, written by a Roman Catholic uh, theologian by Hugo Rana, and he coined a very interesting German neologism, which is Ernst Heiterkeit, which means serious cheerfulness. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and he wrote this book, uh, Man at Play or the Spielende Mensch, and there he argues that uh, if you are um, described by Ernst Heiterkeit, you are uh, able to, even at your highest enjoyment and greatest pleasure, not to overstep certain boundaries and still see, yeah, there are, might be some uh, problems, have, a, uh, have the earth at your feet, uh, but also not take yourself too seriously, uh, and then you are homo vere ludens. Yeah. And it was very interesting for me to see that even theologians then would argue, yeah, this is important. And I think this idea of playful ones being able to combine these two qualities, being serious and cheerful at the same time, reminds you, of course, of work by Csikszentmihalyi on creativity, where he also says, 
they can be less structured but also but also good in goal achievement at the same time that's the same thought here and I think there's a, a, a that's quite interesting and being serious uh, myself uh, we tested this empirically <laughs> as you would have imagined uh, and this works somehow. <laughs> yeah, you can show that uh, those that have higher scores in seriousness and cheerfulness also have higher scores in some of the facets of playfulness. Yeah, but I think that's a quite good way of thinking about what playfulness could be. And um, I have some preliminary findings on an intervention study that we did, but I'm also short on time already, so I would probably like to end here and then leave some time for discussion. <coughs>